Hi, everybody, and welcome to the week ahead. Uh, today, I'm joined by Tracy Shukart, Nick Glinsman, and Sam Rines. Um, Albert couldn't join us today, but he will be back. Uh, he's still friends with us. So um, before we get started, I'd like you to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and like this video. That obviously helps us with visibility. It helps you to get alerts when new videos are out. So if you don't mind, please take care of that now. Um, so this week, uh, we had a lot going on. So we had a, a very strong PPI print come out. Um, we had Chinese PPI come out. So the US print came out at 9.6% year on year. Chinese PPI came out around actually the same level, um, down from 9.1, down from 13%. We had US retail sales surge to 3.8%. It was 2.1% was expected. Equities were down on the week. Crude was sideways. Precious metals were up a bit. A, a, a bit and the 10-year is back below 2%. So what did we say last week? Well, Sam last week said that Monday's Fed meeting was a non-event. Nice job, Sam. Nick said the, that the Fed wouldn't fight volatility. Nice job, Nick. And Tracy, two weeks ago, since that was the last time she was with us, said the crude would trade sideways but be pretty, vol pretty volatile, which it has been. So nice job, guys. You, you nailed that stuff um, right on. So let's start with uh, PPIs. So um, it looks like producer prices are maybe turning over. I, I don't know if it's too early to call that, okay? But based on the, the Chinese data and the US data, it looks like those PPIs may be turning over a little bit. So what do we think about that? Are we going to see PPIs moderate first? And what's the impact on overall inflation, secondary impacts, ultimately CPI and all that stuff? So Sam, do you want to get us started? Sure, I'll I'll, I'll give a little taster uh, to start it off. Uh, you know, I think uh, China tends to lead in terms of PPI, right? So when you begin to see their PPI go from thirteen to nine, you know, give or take a few tenths, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, it's the second derivative is extremely important when it comes to input costs. Uh, we all knew it was supply chain. We all know it's supply chain. And we all know that the supply chain is not fixed yet. Uh, right. So the pace of that decline is unlikely to continue at, you know, 4% month over month or whatever it might be. Uh, but it is going to continue to dissipate, at least on the margin, uh, at least, you know, call it moderately. Uh, that's important. Uh, that does feed into CPI at some point. Uh, and, you know, I, I think one of the interesting points that we talked about last week uh, was housing. Uh, and uh, when you begin to see some of these numbers come down on PPI, you begin to get lower input costs to uh, new starts, et cetera. That, that has a pretty interesting feed-through effect. What did you think about the Fed, San Francisco Fed paper on the owner's equivalent rent, which I thought was reasonably hawkish in terms of that having a half percent impact on CPI, core CPI? Oh, if you're asking me, I yeah, thought yeah. I, I, I thought it I thought it could be hawkish to a degree. But at the same time, it was also in my mind a signal that, that was almost a core thing to them or yeah. an, you know, right? So something that they're going to cut out. Right. So it, is, it, does, it does lag Zillow's and apartment lists. Like quite well, a bit. Yeah, and it always will, right? Yeah, always you know, just on a, on a mechanical basis, it's impossible for the Fed to get a calculation that's going to keep up with Zillow or any of the other indices. Uh, I thought it was almost one of those, it could be really hawkish if they were to incorporate that into their framework. Yeah. What I would say is it's more likely that they'll go in the European direction, which is just cut it out completely in huh. general, from their inflation metrics, which it's dubbish. Interestingly, yeah. this so let week, me, let's move I on this a little bit. Sam, it seems to me that you're indicating that in the PPI, at least, is peaking. Is that, is that fair to say? It, it feels that way. Okay, it feels you know, that way. Okay. It feels, it feels that way. And it certainly looks that way in China that, it, you know, it could take a month or two to feed back into the U.S., but I would say it's speaking. Okay. Now, Nick, I think you take the other point of view where this is sustainable. Is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that fair to say? Well, actually, uh, I think last week I was mentioning that it's going to 
the, the inflation outlook is going to level off. I mean, I agree with Sam on China PPI leading US PPI. Um, but I was just fascinated by that, that particular owner's equivalent rent, the housing comp, uh, part of the uh, CPI composition. And actually in Europe, they're looking to introduce it, which was a paper this week, um, which again would be quite a, quite a surprise. I, I think I just look at um, not just PPI in China as a leader. I think I've seen people say it's sort of three to six months lead time before it impacts the CPI. So we could have to wait a little bit longer for to see it come through. But um, I just think there are other things in the pipeline. And we had this discussion today that suggests to me that financial conditions are of their own making beginning to compress. And if the Fed start to do stuff, we'll compress further. And that will have a negative impact on liquidity, whether you define that by balance sheet or as we defined it, we had a conversation today, reserves bank reserves. And I think um, that's where I see this peak. I don't know whether we've finished, but I think we're going to plateau, if not start to turn around. However, it's where we finish, and where do the authorities want us to finish? 2% above 2% or, you know, if, if, if I'm sure they want some inflation to hit the uh, debt load, but it's the question is, where do we fi finish it? And can you fine tune that accurately? Yeah, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So staying on the China PPI uh, issue, I think uh, if we look at, say, container rates from China and even port backups from China, if we look at the chart that we're showing now, um, the dark blue line is container, um, uh, container traffic at major ports uh, from China. So it looks like from Ningbo that the, the Container traffic has subsided quite a bit uh, over the past month, and uh, you know one would think that that would take some pressure off of supply chains. So if you look potentially at PPI peaking, and and if you look at the kind of order to received rates of some of these multinational companies, it's running at about nine months from say China, Southeast Asia to the U.S. So so will it you know hit here in six to, in, the, in the U.S. Sorry, in six to nine months? Or will it hit later? Do you are you guys seeing those dynamics in in your studies and and with your clients? Do you think that the freight delays and the and the freight out of China is is declining? Tracy, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the data is a little bit skewed because of the Chinese Lunar New Year. Um, but that said, you know, if we do see some pressure let off of China, that will eventually show up here, right? Into, um, you know, I have always said it's going to be 2023 before we kind of see some supply chain issues ease because, you know, what I'm looking at in um, the industries that I particularly look at, which is, you know, materials and, um, and, uh, and, and energy, I mean, that's still hitting those, in fact, it's just starting to hit those industries, um, as far as like pipes are concerned and parts right. and things of, the, of that nature. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if we do see that subside, it will eventually end up, end up here in the US and North America. Um, but again, it's going to be on a kind of a lag time. Right, and so China started stimulating uh, or easing, I'll say, uh, last month um, with a small rate cut. Uh, That's what I was gonna ask you about, Tony. I mean, I okay. know like you and I have talked about CN CNY for years now right. in, the, in the past. And so I wondered what your thoughts were with China beginning sure. to stimulate how it how important is that to um, how important is that that they tackle um, the appreciating CNY? Um, there, there are a number of issues. I think the appreciating CNY is an issue. I think the stimulus is an issue for a, a number of reasons. So the CNY is important. What they've done over the last two years is appreciated the CNY to accumulate commodities. Um, as commodity prices rose, they appreciated the CNY so they could accumulate copper, so they could accumulate crude oil and food and other things. There was a lot of worry about food security uh, through COVID in China. And so they accumulated that stuff. They have a lot in storage. So with the all the political events happening this year with the party Congress in November and other things, it's really important for them to start to stimulate 
and also to make things easier on exporters. And that's why it's important to, to uh, devalue the currency. It's a controlled currency. So uh, it's a, it is in fact a devaluation uh, that they'll do. Um, and so, uh, so they have to devalue to get those uh, exporters on sides and to start accumulating say more dollars and other currencies. Um, and so, you know, with that uh, devaluing um, and the easing will also come fiscal spending, as we've talked about in Q2 and into Q3 before that party meeting. So it's a really important time for China to make their currency cheaper and to get money out into the channel. And the money tra transmission mechanism in, in China is a lot more direct than it is in the U.S. It's a lot more direct. So the PBOC says get money out and the banks get money out. It just happens, you know, the old school, the way it used to in the U.S. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah, absolutely. It really does. Okay. Anything else on China and the impacts of, say, China uh, easing while the ECB and, and Fed are tightening? Any concerns there? I mean, I would say, you know, does that mean that we see a rotation somewhat into Chinese equities or? Um... I think that's possible, right? I think, you know, although there is some currency risk there, um, I think the growth, the pent up demand and the growth there may be an opportunity. It really depends on horizons, but, um, and it's something we have to watch, but I, I think it may be an opportunity uh, for some sort of rotation to China. Again, not in the main, but at the edges of a portfolio. People have been waiting for that for a couple of months and it's still not <laughs> happening. And each yeah. time, you know, each time, so Tencent's now on the investigation by the USDR, Evergrande has just been delisted from Hong Kong. Um, and I think there was another set of technology restrictions imposed by the CCP. So every time you think, oh, this could be the right time, bang, something yeah, else. But but Chinese technology is for China and it's for Asia. It's not for the U.S. Yeah. necessarily. So no, 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 most of those Chinese companies are really focused on the domestic and the regional market, not necessarily on the U.S. I so, understand it. But that's been a lot. Of, the Chinese tech has been a big expression of interest by the Westerners. Yep. And, yep. and that's where it's, you know, we've got to watch. Yep. Okay. And Tracy, you, um, you tweeted about global mobility earlier this week. And so we're showing that that tweet now. So I'm curious, you know, what's your thought on, um, on mobility and the impact that that will have on global oil demand? I mean, I think that we're going to see, I think as we're seeing these countries that are slowly lifting demand, especially, um, especially like Switzerland that just lifted all their uh, mandates, including if you're flying to Switzerland, you don't need a test anymore, you don't need a back pass, you don't need. And so I think that this will be a global trend, right? Not, mm. it won't be even, but, yeah. but so as we head into summer, which is high season demand, right? For, for you know, the, the Northern hemisphere, um, then, um, you know, we're going to see demand. I mean, demand is almost at, well, depending on who you ask, <laughs> is almost at 19, uh, 2019 levels, if not above. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, they're looking at, you know, May to, to August demand increasing by 5 million barrels per day at over 103 million barrels per day. I mean, that's a lot of increase in demand and we're just not seeing supply come mm -hmm. online anywhere. So um, I definitely think that although we're kind of seeing some consolidation and you know, if we see uh, Russian Ukraine tensions kind of pull back a little bit or dissipate, then I, we could see a, you know, a bigger pullback back into say the mid, mid eighties. But I think we're still headed for over a hundred in, into the summer just because of literally supply demand fundamentals. Interesting. Okay. So while we're on energy, we have a viewer question from, uh, from Twitter from Clifford Topham. Um, he says, following BlackRock's about turn on fossil fuels in response to Texas potential threat of removing BlackRock, BlackRock from managing state pensions, is this the start of a change in attitude by Wall Street? So is it the beginning of the end of ESG? Well, I think that, um, I think, well, you know, Wall Street is about greed, right? I mean, <laughs> we all watch the that's movie. Right. Um, that's where the money is. So what I think is going to happen is though we'll st still see these smaller banks, 
um, and these smaller insurance companies, et cetera, that we have seen this week kind of pull back and not get involved in the ONG industry. I still think that we're going to see these major investment firms and these major banks still hang on to that, if not increase their exposure. Okay, Sam, are you seeing that with your clients with uh, on the ESG side? Is, it, are there, is there any movement there? Uh, there's not a lot of movement there uh, okay. in terms of real money, right? So, you know, you can have a bunch of small insurance companies, you can have a few small pension funds, you can even have, you know, a, a few small colleges. Um, in the grand scheme of things, who cares? Um, you're still getting all the votes going in the wrong direction uh, for oil and gas companies. Uh, you still have Exxon uh, being told that it needs to divest of oil and gas, which is nuts because yep. it's literally an oil company. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, to be honest, we're not seeing a significant reversal of ESG. Um, uh, we're seeing maybe, you know, call it a billion, three billion, uh, that type of potential money flowing okay. into the space. And that's if you look at their portfolios and say, uh, do a 2% overweight to the S&P 500 and go 7.5%, you know, that's, it simply isn't that much money. Okay. Okay. Very good. Let's move on to volatility. Nick, you talked about volatility last week, and I want to dig into that a little bit. We've seen volatility. We've seen the VIX approach 30 this week. Um, and so I'm curious, based on your hypothesis last week, do you see that sustaining? Do you see the VIX increasing? And like over what time frame? Um, I think the volatility broadens out to other markets. So okay. for example, we've had uh, VIX can be, look, at between 32 and 34, it's known that some people come in and suppress the, the VIX. The Fed have been active in sellers. Uh, that's well known. And, they, you know, they cover it when it gets down to lower. And, and in fact, in the zero rate world, it's been in the Fed's uh, modus operandi to suppress volatility. And thus, hence, you had the forward guidance. With this diminishing forward guidance, and Mester mentioned it this week as well, that as we as they start to hike rates, potentially do QT, tighten up everything, the use of forward guidance has been diminished to it would be a hindrance. You, you know, the whole point of tightening is not to give the full scope of what's coming. Okay. Um, but the important thing is for all subsidiary markets, the volatility in the treasury market has exploded. Now remember, everything is priced off of the risk-free asset. Right. So you you know you've seen the move index fly higher, um, and what what that the reason why that's so important is bid off bid off of spreads on the treasury market have actually well widened. So that means there's a liquidity issue. And if you remember back in 2020, you had the repo crisis, which was a liquidity issue. If that continues, then the, the bid off of spread and thus liquidity in credit markets, which should be beginning to suffer and CDX rates were, were spiking higher today, that will suffer. That will then feed through to equity markets. You will have less liquidity, hence higher volatility. So it's a very risky path. Um, and it will be a very volatile path from now on. Fun. Okay. And so when you say from now on, you mean over the next, say, through the end of the year, or is this, a, is this something that happens as we, say, approach QT in second quarter? This should carry on happening. Okay. Until, you know, I mean, I, was, I, I mentioned to you earlier, I tend to, I still don't trust this Fed. I think it could end up being stop, start, stop, start. Mm-hmm. Tighten, tighten, tighten. Oh, the economy right. is beginning to crash. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? So it's just going to, I think this is going to carry on for quite a while. Okay. Sam, you, you started to interject, but did you want to add something? On yeah, that? no, I was, I was just going to, I was going to take the other side of that saying that the Fed communicating less is, in my opinion, a, a VIX suppressor at this point, because if you don't have Bullard coming out and saying stupid things that nobody should have ever taken seriously, you don't inject half of the volatility that you currently have in the market right now. Uh, you, you don't have the possibility of an intermediate hike. You don't have the 50 basis points. You don't have the you know, QT coming potentially in March. Uh, so in a way, I think taking away the forward guidance and beginning to actually have some sort of a coherent path with an economy that hasn't actually broken yet, um, 
you know, 30 VIX, I'm a seller. I, 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 I sell that all day. Um, and if something uh, happens in Ukraine, sell it again. And you get, you know, I think that's probably the best risk adjusted return mm. this year is selling VIX on spikes. Mm. Interesting. Very good. Okay, guys, what are we looking for the week ahead? Tracy, what, what's on your mind uh, for the week ahead? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, again, I think that oil markets are probably going to move sideways until we get some sort of resolution. Um, as far as this Ukraine-Russia deal, I think the equity markets are still skittish about that. Um, again, I think we'll see a lot of volatility there. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, Precious metals will continue to do well sideways to up, perhaps, um, right? Because that market is kind of crazy, um, but it does well uh, on uncertainty. Um, and I think that um, I think that if you're looking at you know basin industrial metals, that will uh, continue to see those rise because we're having political problems. Um, say, for instance, with copper in uh, Chile and Peru because of uh, the new leftist government. There. How so, much of global uh, supply is Chile and Peru? Uh, 40%. 40%. Okay. So that, that, that's, a, that's a little issue. A lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Very good. Um, Sam, did you have something? Oh, no. I just was okay. commenting. Yeah. Like, yeah but Nick, what are you looking for? Team. What are you looking for next week? A continuation of what we've had this week. And I think at some point, um, I think, I, I, you know, it's going to be up and down on Ukraine. Who knows, right? Um, I, I, I do think the rhetoric from the Fed will continue. I think what's interesting to me is, you know, I, I take a, the most retail of retail ETFs to see whether retail has sold anything on the way down. And that would be ARC. They haven't sold anything. So mm. there is a whole lot of pain out there. Um, and, you know, you've got, I just think we're volatile with a downside bias. Yes, you're going to have a spike up on good news. We had that this morning and it all gave back. Didn't, yeah, it didn't keep it. Pretty much, it didn't keep it. So uh, I think there's something more than just Ukraine behind everything. And I think this volatility, and my point on, you know, I don't disagree with Sam on the VIX, but I think this, what's going on in the, fixed income markets will come as a surprise and will flow through and just make trading difficult. Okay, so, let me ask you also, uh, we'll take this from you and then we'll, we'll move it to Sam as well. Will we see the 10 year rise above two again? If things calm down, it goes straight back above two. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Sam, what do you think about, about rates, about uh, the 10 year? Oh, so what I would say is, uh, I would completely flip on my comment that it's all curve flatteners from last last week and say, hey, it's curve steepener now. Uh, any good news on Ukraine, any anything, anything. You saw it when a few tanks moved or supposedly right. moved. You got a big move in oil. You got a big move in the curve. Uh, you got the FOMC minutes, et cetera, et cetera. A everything from here in terms of a dissipation you know, it looks like curve steepener uh, to me with two stuck somewhere between 140 and 150. Okay. And twos heading north or in tens heading north. So okay. really like the steepener now. Okay. So it sounds like you all are saying we're kind of in a wait and see for most markets. Is that fair to say? Wait and watch. <laughs> Wait and watch. Yes. Wait and watch. Yeah. Okay. Great. No big decisions over the next week. Is that what you're saying? Keep, keep your risk tight and small. I mean, everybody's going to be watching um, Ukraine and Russia, and everybody's going to be watching the March meeting okay. for the Fed. Until then, you know, I think you could see, you know, a lot of volatility in the markets, whether it be in equities, um, the U.S. Treasuries, or um, commodity markets. Very good. Guys, I always appreciate this. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.